Last week, we ended our message with a proclamation. I'm going to ask if you would make that with me again today. And it says this, Jesus, you are God manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Holy Spirit, seen by the angels. We proclaim you among the nations so that you will be believed on in the world and we look forward to joining you in glory. Would you say that together with me with conviction? Okay, there it is right there. Jesus, you are God manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Holy Spirit, seen by the angels. We proclaim you among the nations so that you will be believed on in the world, and we look forward to joining you in glory. Jesus, we've been praying, we've been singing, we've been worshiping Holy Spirit. We've been, we've been in the presence. Uh, we know that uh, Holy Spirit, you are in each of us who has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We also know that you, your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people. So surely you are here in full authority and full power. And we ask Holy Spirit that you do whatever it is that you want to do today in every person in this room. We are here on assignment. And, and we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be free to do everything you want to do. If there's anything that would keep you, Holy Spirit, from doing what you want to do today, that you would remove that from us. Whether it's an attitude, a spirit, uh, uh, unbelief, whatever it is, Lord, that you would just remove that so that you would have complete and total access to do whatever it is you want to do for us, with us, and through us today. We love you, Father God. Thank you for your beautiful creation. Thank you for creating us in your image and likeness. Thank you for creating us for relationship. Thank you for creating us in freedom and in love. And then thank you for sending Jesus so that we could be reconnected to you after, after sin came in. And that because of Jesus, we are free from death, hell, sin, and the bondage that goes along with those things. We thank you. We look forward to seeing, Holy Spirit, what you want to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Last Sunday was Father's Day, and hopefully you enjoyed the uh, pelican snowballs as we uh, left. The, 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 it was one of the better ideas the Holy Spirit's given me, was to have uh, pelicans waiting for us as we left the sanctuary last Sunday. Um, remember last week we talked about that the Paul's praying, and, and as Paul is instructing Timothy, who is going to be instructing um, other people under him and eventually us, uh, specifically in the in the group of Ephesus, the church of Ephesus, which had some unique situations. Every church has some unique situations because of where they're where they are or what their history is or whatever. Ephesus was no different. It had some pretty big worship going on to Diana, and uh, because of that influence, um, it influenced the entire town. It was a very important place, and. Gateway is a very important place in Goodlettsville, a very important town. So it applies to us. But last week he said that the church is called to be a pillar and a buttress in the world today. And the pillar is not just the thing that holds the building up, but the pillar is also, remember, the pillar of fire by night that gave direction and protection. Without the church, America is completely helpless we are the pillar and we are the buttress, the church. So can the church be everything it's called to be if it remains silent on all topics? Well, no, absolutely. We need to be, we need to be verbal because we have the truth. We have the truth and we want to share the truth. And so that was, that was important then in, in Ephesus. It's important today in wherever we are. And so that's, that's kind of what's going on. But <clears throat> if I were to, to write you a letter, it would be kind of silly for you to take one sentence out of that letter and build an entire doctrine on that. You would take that sentence in the letter in the context of the letter. So as we go through 1 Timothy, there have been people who have taken little sections out and, and, and made him complete doctrines or churches out of those little sections. We don't want to do that. We want to read, we want to read those things in the context of, of this one very long um, uh, letter that, that Paul wrote to Timothy. I actually had it printed up on a long, you know, I, t I taped several pieces of paper and it was out there in the hallway. And I don't think that it's still out there, but I remember somebody, maybe it was Nadine walked by and she goes, oh my, you know, it's like, that's a, that's a long letter. 
Remember, when Timothy gets this letter, he reads it in its totality, and then he begins to break it apart, and he begins to share the different parts, and that's what we're having to do. Uh, it's either that or we'd have to have a month-long uh, worship service, and it's not a bad idea, but not today. So, um, <clears throat> we know that that statement that we just made, that proclamation we just made, it actually is registered kind of in church history is that was one of the first worship songs in the New Testament church. Um, Jesus, you're a God manifested in the, in the flesh, vindicated by the Holy Spirit, seen by the angels. It's so, it's, so, it's so great. It's a great worship thing. And there's a lot of doctrinal statements in there. So it's really important. I, I, heard, I heard one pastor this week and he talked about when anytime we're talking about Timothy, and especially about the Word of God, that the church and Christians are to proclaim, protect, and promote the Word of God. And it's easy to do some of those. Maybe it's, maybe it's not as easy as we'd like for it to be, but to protect, to proclaim, and to promote. So proclaim means declare officially and publicly, okay? So are you and I proclaiming the word of God, declaring it officially and publicly. Well, you know, people don't really want to hear the word of God because now it's, it's, it's listed as hate speech. So we just kind of keep it to ourselves. Okay. If we are called to proclaim, and that means to declare officially and publicly, we need to be speaking the word of God in public. Okay. That's really important. And then to protect to keep safe from harm. That's now I'm, I've never been one that thinks, okay, we need to get up an army so we can go defend God. God doesn't need us to defend him. him okay. He's, he, he can handle everything on his own, but what we are supposed to do is we're supposed to protect the word of God. Well, the word of God really isn't, is it really isn't accurate. It really isn't valid. It really doesn't matter. It really, it really isn't uh, like we say, timely, true, trustworthy, and true. So we want to protect it. And, and, um, there's a conversation I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to have very soon. And, and I realized that the, the punchline of my conversation with this person, who I love very much, is going to be, you and I don't look at the Word of God the same. You look at it as a nice little untrue story. For me, it is everything. It is the beginning. It is the end. It is everything. Everything I do should be, I'm not saying every, everything is, but everything I do should be based out of the word of God because it's the one, it's the one solid in everything else that's, that's not very solid. So we're supposed to proclaim, protect, and then promote further the progress of. How do you further the progress of something? Well, you know, they say the best advertisement for any business is word of mouth right? You just tell somebody, man, I, I had the best hamburger I've ever had. I, I, I had the best. I took my car to this place. They like, they cleaned it. They washed it. They fixed it. They rolled back the odometer. It was awesome. This, <laughs> whatever it is, it's word of mouth. How, how are we, pro, how are we proclaiming and promoting and protecting with the way that we speak about God and about his word. So those are really important. So here we are. We're in chapter four of first Timothy, and uh, we're going to read the first three verses. Now, <clears throat> the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to the deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that, that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Okay. So he's, he's talking about, okay, there's going to be some, there's going to be some stuff, some false teaching, some inaccurate teaching and the origin, we see the origin, it's the, the, coming to themselves, deceitful spirits, and teaching of demons. Okay, that's kind of the origin. And then he, he tells us the attitude there, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. And then he tells us a little bit about the message who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving. So, so we've got those three things. Now, how many of y'all like to canoe? Just pretend and raise your hand. So how many of you like to canoe? You're going canoeing today, and I say, hey, look, I need to just warn you right now. There are elephants in the trees 
above the, the Caney Fork River, and they will fall in your boat. Okay. Now you're like, uh, yeah, number one, no. There, Mike, we would be able to see the elephants. Elephants don't climb trees. That's silly. We're not going to be, we're not even going to take this serious. We just think this is a joke. Okay, fair enough. But what if I say, okay, it's not elephants who will be um, hanging out in the trees waiting for you to go under them. It's butterflies. Now, that actually could happen. You probably will see some butterflies as you're floating down the Caney Fork River and you look over you and, the, and there's butterflies in the trees. And that's really cool. And that's, that's something that's going to actually be there. But how many of y'all are afraid of butterflies? Unless you're sitting there completely, <laughs> completely unaware and one flies into you. And then it's like you're, you feel like you've been attacked. But what if I say... You really want to watch out for snakes because they do like to hang out in the trees that are over the... And some of y'all are going, yep, I've been there. I know. So of those three scenarios, one of them is ridiculous. One of them is really not a threat, but one of them is actually a threat. So when, when Paul is writing to Timothy and he talks to him about... He said, the, um, they are devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. And there are a lot of people in the church who go, okay, well, he's saying spirits and demons, but what he really just means are people who, they, they just don't see it the way we see it. They, they're really, are, are there really demons that we have to worry about? Yes, there are really demonic entities that we deal with. Jesus dealt with them, and we're in the same world that Jesus was in. We're going to deal with demonic in, entities. And, and so we need to learn how to identify them and then say, no, go, you're not welcome here. So that's really important because if you, if you deny that and you say, well, it's, there, there are people who are just, it's just a psychological disorder. I'm not saying there aren't psychological disorders. I'm not saying that there aren't physical disorders that affect people. But what I am saying is along with psychological disorders and physical disorders, sometimes there's just a demonic disorder that you have to understand because you can, you can send somebody to therapy all day long and that won't do anything about that demon that is attacking them or the demon that they might be oppressed by. So that's really important. So he goes on to say, um, this thing about, about the conscience is seared. Now, I, I just really think that's important because seared conscience is, I, I think there's, there's a medical term for that. There is a psychological term for a person who has a seared conscience. Let me see if I can find it. The, psycho, uh, the psychological diagnosis for that is, um, I'm trying to remember, I don't want, it's not, is it sociopath? Yeah. It's sociopath. They, they don't feel, they don't feel anything. And so, because they don't feel anything, there's no, there, there's no um, conscience that's keeping them from doing or not doing the right thing. I'm, a, I'm assuming every person in here, that none of y'all or sociopaths, okay? I'm, <laughs> I'm counting on that. Um, but, but what happens when we're, we're, we are turned so over to sin that we get seared where, where we just don't even, we don't even recognize the fact that every person has the law of God written on their heart. But there's so much sin and there's so, there's so many things that happen that that gets seared. And then they eventually get to the point where they don't even realize, okay, even, even I think this is bad. Even I think this is wrong. So that can happen. The good news is I believe that through God, through the Holy Spirit, that searing, that, that sealing can be broken. But the Bible talks about conscience in different ways. In 1 Timothy 1, 5 and 19, it says that a conscience can be good. You can be of good conscience. In 1 Timothy 3, 9, you can have a clear conscience. 1 Corinthians 8, you can have a weak conscience. Hebrews 10, 22, you can have a guilty conscience. Titus 1, 15, you can have a corrupted conscience. And then we get to 1 Timothy 4, where you can have a seared conscience. Your conscience is your co-knowledge with oneself and God. Your co-knowledge of oneself and God. You can see why it's really important that we never let that get seared, where it separates us from being able to have a co-knowledge with God. What do, we, what do we have the co-knowledge of? What is right and what is wrong? That's the reason we say, well, you know, that, that person's conscience just doesn't allow them to do that. It's because their co-knowledge with God 
goes, this is wrong. I know this is wrong. We do that a lot of times. I'm not the only one in here who's ever done anything that you knew was wrong, right? Some of you have done that. Okay. Co-knowledge is important. And so we want to have, we want to be people of good and clear conscience, not those other things. So what are some of the non-gospel um, doctrines that, that he said that we need to be looking for? Well, he names, he names two specifically. One is that, that you're never supposed to marry, and the other is that you're supposed to abstain from all these foods. Okay, so let's just talk about, um, how do I say this without, please listen to everything I'm about to say before you make a snap judgment. We, when's the last time, and you may have said it because I've said it, when's the last time you've said it or you've heard somebody say, you can't be a Christian and vote for this person. You can't be a Christian and shop at that store. You can't be a Christian and support this. We, we have taken, we, we've taken the gospel and we've changed it about, uh, from being about Jesus and the work on the cross to, 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 to you and your particular belief, your particular behavior. Now, do I think that as a Christian, there are certain things I'm not supposed to do? And I can go, look, as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm not going to shop there. I'm not going to vote for this person. I'm not going to support that thing. Yes. But if we take that, you can't be a Christian and dot, dot, dot. Okay, at the end of that dot, 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 may be something that you're currently doing. You can't be a Christian and gossip. You can't be a Christian and overeat. Oh man, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm out of the herd. You can't be a Christian and dot, dot, our, our salvation is not based on our behavior. It's based on the work of Jesus Christ and our acceptance of his redemption and my need for redemption, right? So I'm not saying, because again, I, I meet with a lot of people and I have a lot of conversations with people and I can say, as a, as a Bible-believing Christian, I cannot do this. I cannot vote for that. But we need to be careful that we don't begin to get in the judgmental business because you can't be a Christian and be judgmental, okay? That's kind of the end, that's the end of that. So, but what he's talking about is he was saying, look, I know that Jesus worked on the cross. He did most of what needs to happen. But to get it all the way over, you need to stay single so that you can be completely committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you, so you can be commit, completely committed. You should not marry and, and reproduce. There's a problem with that. In the garden, God said, first assignment, be fruitful and multiply. Okay, so, so this thing actually goes against the heart and the word of God. Now, do I think that there are some people who probably, like for, for this place and this time, it would be better for you not to marry for, for this period of time because of your focus would be on this? That, that might happen, but you can't change that to be, it's a condition of salvation. It's a condition of really being sold out to Jesus, whether or not you're married or single. And then the other thing is about, about the food. Okay, and we can see that this is, what do we call this today? We call it legalism. Okay, if you dance, I knew, I knew an evangelist, he said, if you don't take a nap after church on Sunday, you're probably not saved. Now, I'm not sure he's wrong, but no. <laughs> My, you know, so we've, we've got to be careful that we don't change even we we don't ever want to change the gospel of jesus christ it is perfect the way it is and that is that i'm a sinner that that separates me from the from, from the father god the creator he made a way where there was no way jesus did a work on the cross so that i wouldn't have to because i couldn't and now I have traded places with Christ because he traded places with me and I'm in Christ and I want to live out of that relationship. I'm not working for that relationship. I'm working because of that relationship. And we're going to get on to that. Okay. So man, that's just the first three verses, verses, uh, four and five. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. All right. This is not God saying, 
This is not Paul saying on the Holy Spirit's behalf. Eat the dozen donuts, it's fine, as long as you pray after and before and during. You know, I, I'm, I'm just, we, we just don't, we can't take, again, you don't take this out of context as I see that Bible saying right there, I can do anything I want to do. Our want to should line up with Jesus' want to, okay? So, so the, there's these things, but notice what it says. Everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Um, I had a little experience this week and I just, um, I told Sally I was going to figure out how to work it into the, the message. Um, is, God a, is God a good father? Yes. And does he know how to good give good yes. gifts? Yes, he does. Okay. So um, uh, Sarah and, and Leah, they, they've, they've kind of developed this little uh, reading contest for their, for their kids. Um, and uh, they were telling me about it. Yeah, we're going to like give rewards and give points and all that stuff. And I said, oh, we'll definitely put Pappy down, taking him to Pelicans. That would be one of the rewards. And so um, I found out that Oaks has reached the point where it's time for Pappy to take him to Pelicans. And so um, we were together, I guess, Friday. No, it was Thursday. It was Thursday. And, and um, I said, hey, man, I hear you passed your, you, you know, you, you made enough points to have Pelicans with Pappy. And he goes, yeah, we should go tomorrow. <laughs> now, I got to be honest. My first thought was, dude, you got to make an appointment to be with me. I mean, I mean, I got to check my schedule. I got to, I, I got to make sure you don't tell me when I'm going to bless you. I tell you when I, and then I, and then it hit me. It's like, isn't that the way God is? is isn't that the way God wants us to come with that childlike faith and say, oh God, you're going to give me something. Okay. Well, tomorrow would be awesome. I will, I will t- tomorrow. Let's do that tomorrow. And God is like, Absolutely. God's not making us go through these, these hoops and we'll get on his schedule and get on his calendar and maybe three weeks from now uh, you, you contact my secretary and she'll put you on the schedule. It's not that at all. It's, it's like childlike faith. And that to me is so good because every good gift comes from the Father above. Um, um, Sally asked me to explain this. She proofreads my messages so that I don't, say something completely wrong. Should you keep your temple, your body, uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit, should you do your best to keep yourself healthy? Yes, we should. We should. Okay, we take that in consideration with this verse. And here's what she asked me to, okay, my, my body is the temple of the Most High God. For some people, they would say, my body is the bouncy house of the most high God. And she was like, what do you mean by bouncy house? I'm just being silly, but we have a responsibility to keep ourselves healthy because we are the temple of the most high God. And, um, as a, as a pastor who gets seen on, you know, I had a dream last night that this lady made me get on a scale and, and it was 20 pounds more than I actually am. And I woke up like, ah, that's horrible. So anyways, that has nothing to do. Just talk about nightmares. Verse six, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. Um, Have you ever played the game telephone? How many of y'all remember playing telephone? For those of you who don't know, and you apparently lived alone, maybe you're an only child, telephone was just telling yourself something. You would you get a circle of people and you tell you whisper something in the ear of that person, and then they whisper it in that person, 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 and it comes back around, and then you find out how like it's just something totally different. To protect, promote, and and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that we're not like a game of telephone work. I I have no actual experience of this, but here's what a friend told a friend, told a friend, told a friend. We are all supposed to have absolute personal knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we can correctly share it. Now, a game of telephone where I tell, I tell, uh, I, I tell, what's your name? I tell Elijah, and then I don't let Elijah tell Emma. I tell Emma, and then I don't let Emma tell Sally. I tell Sally. 
that's, that's the way we're, we're wanting to do this, is to make sure that we are speaking the word of truth one person to one person. And the good news is we have the Holy Spirit living inside us, who is the origin of all of it, and he is speaking directly to us. All right, verses 7 and 8. Having nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, uh, rather train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value in godliness, uh, um, in, in some value, godliness is of the value in every way as it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. That word irreverent, irreverent, um, it's better translated profane. So literally it goes against the word of God. We're, we're not supposed to be speaking of things that go against the word of God. If, if you're wondering about, you know, I, I, I've heard this thing and I, before, I, before I repost it, before I, you know, like it with a big heart and a smiley face, maybe I should find out exactly, is this actually scriptural? And, and that's, a, that's always a good question to ask. We don't want to support or promote something that's irreverent or profane. Um, and then when he talks about wives' tales, I, I have some bad news for you. Carrots, you can eat carrots until you're orange, they will not improve your eyesight. I'm sorry, yeah. Gum, if gum was going to stay in your stomach for seven years, I would have died a long time ago, okay? <laughs> Cracking your knuckles does not cause arthritis. Coffee does not stunt your growth, Amen. okay? Good news. <laughs> but those are, those are things that we've heard, you know, we heard it and we just repeated and repeated it. We are supposed to have firsthand knowledge of the Word of God. Um, once we are right with God through Jesus, it will have an effect on how we live. It will. But we need to be careful that, that we don't that we don't go back to that concept of I'm just going to you you have to think act respond exactly like i do or you're not you're not saved uh, there's a, an, another example but we'll we'll get into it let's do 9 and 9 and 10 first the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living god who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Now, first of all, he's the savior of all people, especially those who believe. There are people, again, we'll take this out of context and say, okay, this proves universalism. Everybody saved, everybody's saved at the end. That is not what it's saying. What it is saying is of all men who will be saved, the only way of salvation is Jesus. Jesus is the savior of all mankind, who will be saved? There is no other option. There is no other savior. All of mankind only has one opportunity for salvation, and that's through Jesus Christ. So that's the reason it, it's written that way. So just to clear that up. But now let's go back. Um, deserving a full acceptance, for to this end, we toil and strive. Now, for any of you who've been through heart sync training, you're like, oh, we're not supposed to strive. Okay, there's, there's a striving to gain something, and then there's the striving from what you've received. Okay, very different. One is earning something, the other is working out of something that was given to you. For example, um, we, we've been given this great salvation, we're not working for this salvation, but because I have this salvation, I want to do everything in my power to, to promote, proclaim, and protect that, that message. Um, you, you, you go to work and your boss, your boss says, look, um, you did a great job. Uh, I'm, I'm, not only am I going to pay you what, you what you're due, I'm going to give you a bonus and a day off. The day after you come back from that day off, you're going to go, this is a man I want to strive for. This is a man I want to work hard for. This is a, this is a person who, who rewarded me and, and just blessed me. You know what? This guy, I want to do my best for him. And so you are striving from that. 
not for it, okay? So don't, don't see the word strive as a bad word because sometimes we, we put it as a bad word. But it's just talking about, look, I just got blessed. I'm going to go bless. I just got, I just got brought to, to newness of life and I want to live like I have newness of life. I don't want to live like, like the, the potato, couch potato that I was before. I want to, I'm going to do my best to do everything I can do for this. A labor of love, not a labor so that I'll be loved. This is not about, I need to work as hard as I can so God will love me. Because God so loved the world. We love because he first loved us. While we were yet sinners, he loved us. We are working out of an overflow of his love, not a vacuum of his love that we're trying desperately to fill up. Oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, let me do enough to make God happy with me today. Oh, please, oh, please, let God love me today. He already loves us so much that he sent his son to be our redeemer. That's why he's talking about because of this, we, we want to we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all. Verse 11, command and teach these things. Now, the word command there, convey these things, uh, these things of the gospel. Convey these things. Speak these things as if you know they are true. When you have friends who say, well, I, don't, I just don't believe all that Bible stuff. I don't believe about Jesus. I, I'm sure he was a nice guy and all that other stuff. We, it, what it means there is you speak with authority. No, I know in whom my Redeemer is. I know that Jesus is my Redeemer. I know that God is the God. He is the creator of heavens and earth. I know, who I, I know him because I, I know of him because I know him. So we begin to, to really proclaim as in, uh, as in command, carrying the light of the gospel. Verse 12. Let no one despise you for your youth, but, uh, but I'm sorry, but, but set the believers an, an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. We know that Timothy, Timothy was like 15 when he met Paul, but he's not 15 anymore. He's 30, but he's still very young to be in the position that he's in. Remember, he's not just the pastor of a small little house church. He's kind of the pastor over many house churches all across Ephesus. He, had a, he has a pretty high position, but we, we kind of pick out from him that there were times that, that he didn't, he wasn't exactly sure that he had the authority to, to, to be who he was. And so Paul was re responding to him and, and reminding him, look, man, don't, don't let anybody look down on the fact that you're younger. Don't let anybody look down that you don't, have, uh, you don't have the gray hairs that somebody else has. So that's what he's saying in one half. And some of y'all are in this room and you need, you need to hear that said. Don't, don't, let, don't let anybody look down on you because you might be younger in the faith than somebody else. Or that you might be a young person. Um, because what you have is very important. But then secondly... I think what Paul is saying is also, okay, so don't give them a reason to look down on you because you're young. Be mature. Don't be immature. Don't do foolish things, but live in such a way so that people go, man, that young person really has it together. That person really, really carries himself well. So I think it says both of those things. First, that we don't want anyone to look down. We don't want to feel bad about being young. Um, and second, we don't want to give anyone reason to, to look down on us. And then the next three verses, 13 uh, through 15 says, uh, Until I, I come, devote yourself to public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given by the prophecy, uh, given by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Okay? Um, Paul hoped that he was going to be able to return and be with Timothy at some point and be with the church in Ephesus. And, uh, and so, so he was, you know, 
Timothy was hoping that too. We, we, we don't believe that Paul ever made it back to that point. But he said, he said, but while you're waiting, um, do these things. Because, you know, how many of y'all want, want to be caught, you know, really being busy when, when the boss shows up? It's like the boss walks in and you're just busy and that, that looks really good, you know? Um, I, I have a, a favorite little story for, for me. For all those years that I worked for Lifeway, we would um, we would go to a store and we would remodel, we would relocate, we would um, close if that was what we were doing. But um, I was one of a, of a multiple of crew. But but I was the only one who had the relationship with Jack Keller in that group. Now, Jack was friends with a lot of them, but I had known him longer. Um, Jack and I had, you know, we 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 were just have a great relationship. It was different. When Jack would show up on the job site, there were some people who would get scared because it's like, oh no, he's the big boss. He's, you know, if I'm not doing everything I'm supposed to be, there were some guys who were like, okay, this is great because Jack's going to answer, he's going to answer some questions that I have. There are some people who are like, you know, Jack, Jack is just tall. He's from Michigan. He's loud. When he walks in, you know, he's entered the room. Some people are just kind of like, whoa, what is that? But when I looked up and I saw Jack walking through that door, I thought, it's lunchtime. <laughs> because, because I knew no matter what was going on in the store, he was going to come over. He was going to hug me. Hey, buddy, how you doing? What's going on? How you, you know, and then like, okay, as soon as I'm done with this meeting, we're going to go to lunch. Because that's the relationship that I had with him. Good news. Jesus is coming back. And when Jesus walks in, there are people who are going to be scared to death. There are people who are going to be having a lot of questions. But you and I, it's like lunchtime. He's here. So that's, again, why do, why do I want to strive? Why do I want to toil? Because Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for me. He's coming back for you. This is like this should be good news. This should help you get through the rest of your weekend, okay? That Jesus is coming back. So, so Paul's saying here, you know, I'm hoping to come back, and until I come back, do these things. How much more important, though, is it for us that we know that Jesus is coming back? So because Jesus is coming back, I want to devote myself to the public reading of the Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching, to not neglect the gift I have. How many of y'all have a gift? Everybody better raise your hand because everybody has a gift. I've told you this before, the Holy Spirit, when he comes to your house, he always brings a gift. Sometimes two or three. We all have gifts and we're all supposed to be doing this, working towards these things. Now, is it easy sometimes to rearrange your life so that you can spend more time doing the things that, that are listed here? Well, no, I mean, we, you know, we're busy people. Some of y'all are so, so busy. And it's like, Mike, I don't know that I have another 15 minutes in my day to, to spend in prayer. I don't know that I have another 15 minutes in my day to, to, to spend in, in reading God's word. I, I, don't, I don't know that I have another, another, you know, evening a week to actually really talk to people about the Lord. Or, or let me encourage you, seek first the kingdom of God and all those other things he adds. He will make room in your schedule for you if you'll make room in your schedule for him. And then finally, the last, the last verse, verse 16. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teachings. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, again, he's not talking about He's not talking about um, losing your salvation, okay? I'm just going to give you the simplest explanation I can about why I don't believe you can lose your salvation. Because there was a point in time where Jesus took his blood and wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. He did all the work. I did none of the work. I cannot lose my salvation. Now, I don't know how many of y'all have been watching the, the, the drafts through the football and everything, and I know in this room we have more than one team we pull for. That's okay. But imagine that somebody who played for the Tennessee Titans last season has been 
traded and now is playing for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, okay? But on that first game, this guy who used to be a Tennessee Titan runs on the field for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but he's still wearing a Titans uniform. Well, maybe his heart's really not into this trade. Okay, but, but maybe, maybe, he, maybe he wears the Tampa Bay Buccaneers jersey, but on the game where they play the Titans, he's doing everything he can do to help the Titans win and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers lose. We would look and go, I don't think this guy is really all in as far as this trade is concerned. What this is saying is if we are in Christ, we should always look like we're in Christ. We should live as a person who is committed to being like Jesus Christ. Are we going to do it perfectly? Absolutely not. And trust me, somebody will point that out to you. No, we, we're not, none of us are going to make it. But every day we become more and more like Christ. As our sanctification process hits, we, get, we find it easier and easier to say no to the things we should say no to and yes to the things we should say yes to. So it's not about losing our salvation. It's, become, it's about being more like Jesus. I shared this Thursday night with, with the guys talk. Um, my brother went into the military straight out of high school. Uh, he's two years ahead of me. And so when he came home from basic training, he was in the best shape of his life, you know. And, and Art's always been a little taller than me anyways. And uh, at that point, I would have probably been, maybe I was 16 or 17 years old. I, I was as tall as I am now, and I weighed a whopping 135 pounds. I was huge. So um, I was the only person in Florida, South Florida, who wore long sleeve shirts year round, so no one would see my arms. And um, I, he got home, and man, we were playing frisbee, and I threw the frisbee up on the roof. And he comes over, and he just grabs me, and he just picks me up over his head, and is like, "Oh my gosh, this is awesome and scary all at the same time." And then, uh, then I go in the house, and his and his green jacket, his green field jacket is over the chair and it says peace all. It's like, it says my name. My name is right there. I'm going to try this jacket on. You know, like I wanted so much to fill out that jacket. I wanted to be as big as my brother. You are wearing the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's like a beautiful robe. Don't you want to just go, wow, I want to fill this out. That's what it's talking about, toiling and striving. We're not doing it so that we get something. We're doing it because we've been given eternal life. We've been given intimacy with the Father. So because of that, it drives us to want to live the life that he wants to give us. So it's about not being on autopilot. It's about being intentional, intentional in our prayer life, intentional in our, t in our quiet time, intentional in the way we minister to people, intentional in the way that we, we, we allow ourselves, we allow ourselves to go, you know what? That's not exactly how I should have handled that. And I'm going to change with the help of the Holy Spirit. So the way we're going to close the service this morning, I'm actually going, I'm going to do a quick prayer and then I'm going to be back at the back. And I know there are, we've got a couple of other people who are going to be back there to pray. If you have a spiritual need this morning or a physical need or whatever, um, you walked in here with a need, there are going to be a group of us back there and we'll kind of be back there around the cross. And we want to pray for you. Um, we believe that God answers prayer. Um, and he is so very good and so very kind and so very powerful. So there's going to be a group of us back just in that corner. If you want to pray, we'll be back there. So stand with me if you would. And um, just close in prayer. So Holy Spirit, We are called to be salt and light in a world that is in desperate need of preservation and is, is in desperate need of the light that shines to you. And so, Father, I just pray for opportunities this week. Um, maybe it's with coworkers. Maybe it's with family. Maybe it's just with somebody we've never met before. And, and this isn't 
an opportunity to talk politics or, or talk anything. It's an opportunity to talk Jesus to the people we come in contact with. That we would be able to show the love of Christ and share the gospel. So Holy Spirit, just give us opportunities. Give us, give us not just boldness to do it, but give us an excitement to do it. Because we get to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that in this ministry time, that uh, if there's somebody who needs something, Lord, that they would just be willing to say, yes, I need this. And they'd make themselves available to what you have. For everyone else, God, I just pray that you would bless them this week with an incredible week that every blessing you have for them, they would find. And uh, like, uh, like Oak said, tomorrow would be great. We love you. We look forward to your return. In Jesus' name, amen.